Well, I am delighted to welcome Brent to our studio today. Hello, Brent. Hello. Thank you for having me. Well, you know, I'm, I'm from Saskatchewan. You're from Tisdale, Saskatchewan. I am. A lot of great people from Saskatchewan. A lot of great people. I was just telling you, the, uh, a friend of my brother said, for a town of 3,000 people, I've met 17,000 people from Tisdale. <laughs> It's it's a city it's a town that defies math and physics. Everyone's from Tisdale, Saskatchewan, especially when Brent Butt came from Tisdale. Suddenly there was a connection all the time. But what is it do you think about Saskatchewan that a lot of people are from there and not a lot of people seem to stay there? Well, I think uh you know there was a big chunk of time. I don't know that it's the same now, but mm-hmm. I think for a lot of years there was uh you know a limited number of opportunities really. It was really agri- agriculturally centric. Mm-hmm. I was going to say agricentric, is that a word? <laughs> I think it is. It should be we'll if it's not it. a word. That's a good word. <laughs> agricentric. Yes. And if you weren't uh you know, if you weren't selling coveralls, you were or tractor tires, <laughs> you were really, you know, like for myself I wanted to get into show business. It's not a hotbed of show business. So I had to leave, but, you know, it's strange, or is it ironic? I never know if something's ironic or not. But anyway, yeah. I ended up getting, you know, my the, the thing that I'm known most for is a, a show back in Saskatchewan. That's true. And I don't think Alanis Morissette even got ironic right. No, so she didn't. So you're, you're not the only person who gets confused I know with a that. lot of the young hipsters I see now, that they use ironic completely wrong. <laughs> they use it like... Uh, You know, facetiously is what they're trying to say. There you go. But nobody uses the word facetious anymore. It's not hip. Facetious, agrocentric. What got you into even the bug of show business in Tisdale, Saskatchewan? I don't know. It's a a mystery. Because right as long as I can remember, it's all I was kind of fascinated by. I used to love watching TV. I was kind of blessed that, you know, we only had two channels. Yeah, what, what do you mean love watching TV? I know, but I loved it. And, and we got, like we had CKBI out of Prince Albert and CFQC out of Saskatoon. Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason, they had a lot of, um, they had license to a lot of old television. Mm-hmm. So I got to see some classic golden age TV stuff. Honeymooners, I Love Lucy, some Jack Benny stuff. Um, and I don't know, I kind of became fascinated with this notion of being funny uh, on TV. And it, it, being funny with my friends is what I always tried to do. And right. I'm from a big family, and I would always try and make my... That was always the high watermark if you could make your older brothers or sisters laugh because they they don't want to laugh at the kid. So if you made them laugh, you really did something, you know. How big a family? I'm I'm number seven of seven. Seven of seven? You, you're the yeah, baby of the, the family? I'm the baby of the family. And you were able to make the older guys laugh? On occasion, yeah. Yes. So that's when, you know, a lot of times you just get like, they give you the stink eye and they say, you're being stupid. <laughs> so that was your f- first criticism. If you could handle that, you could handle anything. Yes. But yeah, I don't know. It's some kind of neuroses, I think, that I need, I need to get up in front of people and be funny. There's some psychosis, I'm sure. They were your original fans. What about your parents? Did they have some questions about your ideas of going into show business? No, not at all. My father was... Uh, kind of a showbiz guy like I mean he, he wasn't in the business but he was a very entertaining guy and he had like an act where people call him up and they would want him to perform at the grandstand shows and stuff you know like that he had he, a bit of a stand-up act not a stand-up act he danced and sang and he he played harmonica and castanets and had a puppet that danced with him all at once it was a <laughs> hell of a thing that's a lot to that's a lot to say never mind to do right. and he did it and uh, he was a very entertaining guy and very funny and then my my mother is also very funny, but she was quietly funny. She, mm-hmm. My mother was always kind of like the, she was the, well, look at the shirt on this guy. That kind of <laughs> quietly funny. Had a bit of a dry humor. Yeah. So I got kind of best of both worlds right. there. The real big performer from your dad and then the subtle humor from your mom. Yeah. Showmanship and subtle observation. Did they actually say, though, Brent, you should get some kind of an education just no. so you have something to fall back on if this comedy thing doesn't work out? No, because they didn't have any kind of an education, and they were happy as clams. <laughs> Honestly, the two happiest people I think I've ever met in my life were my mother and father. <laughs> and, you know, we had a very, we grew up dirt poor, but giggling like idiots, you mm-hmm. know. And uh, we had a, we had a good time. We had a lot of fun around the house. It was a very secure, fun Place so the notion of um, I th- I think we grew up with a different notion of what success was. I think it was just kind of like, as far as my parents were concerned, do what you want to do if you're not hurting anybody, and that's fine. <laughs> and try not to break anything. 
When I told my mother, I was I was twelve when I first saw stand up, and that's when I went to my I saw stand up on TV, and I said I want to be a stand up comedian, and she said go do it outside. <laughs> that was her response to everything. <laughs> do you remember who the stand up was? Kelly Monteith. And where did you see Kelly Monteith? Uh, in the afternoon, so in summer holidays, I, I would get to see afternoon television sometimes, and there was an old talk show, the Alan Hamill Show, which Alan later Hamill, became yes. the Alan Thick Show. Mm-hmm. Um, and they would uh, quite often, two or three times a, a week. It was a five day a week show. Right. Um, they would have a stand up on there. Right. And that's when I became when I first saw a guy just standing there trying to be funny. I thought, Are you nuts? You can do this for a living? <laughs> well, I've been, you know. I'm not going to beat my brains out to heavy lifting or something. <laughs> I love the theme song to Corner Gas, Brent. So do I. I'm a big fan of it. That was composed by uh, Craig Northey and Jesse Valenzuela, uh, each from different bands, uh, Craig from The Odds mm-hmm. and Jesse Valenzuela from Gin Blossoms. But they had worked together, and they were musician pals and uh, came up with that, that song. And when, when they first sent me the little digital file to listen to it, I said, that's... Amazing. Fantastic. Did you give him an idea? Uh, the show's about uh, Little I Town? Told, I told Craig that I wanted a, sh- uh, a theme song, and it's, I want it to be the type of a feel-good song, like on a sunny summer day in the prairies, you're going to hit the highway and go for a road trip, and you crank this tune on. If this song came on the radio, you would crank it. And uh, I think he got what I, I meant and came back with this, and I loved it. Here's something I want to bounce off you, because growing up in Saskatchewan, as both of us did, and now Vancouver is your home base, isn't it? It is. I've been in Vancouver almost 20 years now. You had no problem adjusting to it. I mean, I, my first years in radio were Vancouver Island, and I've shared this story before about how tough that was in the fall. And the people would say Sasquatch attacks <laughs> every morning with a Sasquatch attack. How about the fact it was a low ceiling and people would say, at least you don't have to shovel it. And I'd always say, give me a blue sky, Alberta or Saskatchewan day. I'll, I'll take that over over Vancouver. You've adjusted, obviously. You've been there for 20 years. Honestly, I, I fell in love with it. I, I didn't intend to move to Vancouver. I had been living in Toronto. I lived in Toronto for about four or five years, early s- stages of my stand-up career. And then I popped down to L.A. I was going to pursue the L.A. Hollywood mm-hmm. thing. I didn't have the paperwork to stay down there okay. as I was an illegal uh, alien, alien, right? <laughs> so I came back to Canada to because you got to apply from Canada. And at that time, I just happened to have a bunch of stand-up work uh, booked around BC, Vancouver, over in the island, up mm-hmm. in the Okanagan and stuff. And so I thought, you know, I always come into Vancouver. I always fly in, play a club and leave. And I don't get to see the city much. And it seems like a really nice city. I'm going to hang out here. I got a couple of buddies who live there. I'm going to hang out here for a couple months. And I got an apartment that you could rent month by month without right. a lease. And I was in that apartment for 10 years. I was in that apartment until Corner Gas. <laughs> and... Uh, I've been there almost 20 years now. I just fell in love with the place. Never wanted to leave. Well, I'm glad you enjoy Vancouver. Uh, talk about Corner Gas. Were you doing stand-up and then said, I want to do this TV series? Because that's how it came out to me. You suddenly were a stand-up comic, and then you're appearing in this television show. Yeah, I mean, it's not an uncommon route. You know, uh, television producers uh, and broadcasters, the you know, a successful route to say, okay, Let's find out who's funny, who can consistently be funny, and see if they can translate that into a show. Now, it doesn't always work, but it's a good first step Mm -hmm. to say, okay, here's a guy who's been consistently making people laugh for, whatever, 15 Mm -hmm. years at the time. If you think back to the dawn of radio, that's what they did. They went to the vaudeville stages. They found Jack Benny and George and Gracie, and they they found Milton Berle, people who, who... had proven consistently time and time again they could generate comedic material because that's what you need. And then you try and adapt those talents into the new medium. And so, you know, it's it's nothing new. It's just something that we haven't done a lot of in Canada. In the States, you know, Cosby Show, Seinfeld, you know, Mm -hmm. Newhart, all those shows are based on successful Mm stand-ups. So it was kind of refreshing to have them, uh, you know, I was approached. I wasn't wasn't looking to do this. I was happy being a stand-up. You know, you get to sleep late. Free cocktails, or at least a discount. <laughs> Staff prices, um, and uh, no heavy lifting. So it's all—it's good. It was a dream come true. But you had to come up with the idea then. Well, right? I, I mean, was approached. Do you have any ideas? And mm-hmm. I said, Well, I did have an idea for the show, but a small town, a gas station in a small prairie town. Here's the here's the idea. Here's the rough pitch. They liked the rough pitch. Said, Give us more. Tell us more about it. So I put it. Then I was kind of charged to put together a more formal pitch document. 
a treatment, they call it in the business, television yeah. treatment. So here's what the show would be like. Here's the characters. They liked that. They said, let's see two scripts. So it was incremental. Wow. But then from those two scripts, they just ordered, they went into production. They said, let's do 13 episodes, get to work. How did you feel going from Brent Butt, the stand-up, to Brent Butt, the actor? Because watching Corner Gas, it's like we're watching Brent Butt. I mean, you're just, you just seem so natural in, in well, that. I, I thought I should make the, I didn't know if I could act or not, so I thought I should make the character exactly like me <laughs> so that I know exactly, well, how would I react in this situation? Because I think I'm a good actor within certain parameters, certain narrow parameters. Because Bob yeah. Newhart was never a psychologist. That's right. You know? That's the level of smoke and mirrors he brought to the table. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's, you know, and he's one of my idols. Mm-hmm. I got to meet him. Um, I've got to meet a couple comedy idols of mine so I've been very fortunate yeah. but um, yeah just I made the character very similar to myself and um, yeah just kind of went from there and then you kind of learn the trade you surround yourself by people who know what they're doing um, and I was put in a position where I was I was allowed to kind of drive the boat because it was kind of a condition of mine I said you know I, I have to be in charge of the funny on the show or I can't or I can't do it, and I'm right. not being a diva. I'm just saying that comedy is very delicate, and, and I've been involved in television before where the final say wasn't left up to the funny people, right. and jokes can get ruined when producers or editors who, who don't know how to do it, they don't realize what they're doing wrong. <laughs> and I said, you got to put me in charge of the funny because uh, if you don't, why am I here? I can't, you know, I bring nothing else to the table. <laughs> I can't do the books. Your acting I don't know, skill is just I don't you. Know how many lights we need? <laughs> Um, so I don't know, you know, if you don't put me in charge of the funny, just hire my brother. He'll do it for 50 bucks a day. <laughs> Cheap. He'll Your make brother a show. was disappointed they didn't go that route. <laughs> oh, they would have loved it. 